the topic that, as Vicky mentioned, I have been working on for the past several years, and I have uh, just finished a, a book on it, uh, is about the experiences of Muslim immigrants in Canada with some sort of uh, comparisons with uh, a couple of other immigrant receiving countries. And uh, this is an issue that you will hear about uh, a lot in the media these days. And it is an issue that is going to be much bigger in the, in the future. So it is, I think, a good idea to have some sort of understanding about the, the bigger picture and the general context within which this issue has been uh, discussed so that we can uh, approach them in a more informed way. Uh, I will start with giving you just a couple of personal anecdotals that uh, I think capture the essence of the problem or the research question that I'm trying to address here. One is from just a couple of months ago. Uh, I was at a meeting, professional meeting, and at the end of the day, uh, we went out with other colleagues to have uh, dinner. And I arrived there a couple of minutes late, and they had already gone ahead and ordered what they wanted with the understanding that they would share whatever they get. And when I got there, they asked me, what do I like to order? And I said, whatever you have ordered is OK, as long as there is one of them that doesn't have pork in it. And uh, sure enough, all of them had pork in it. So, <laughs> And they, they had to change the strategy and basically order individually. And one of the colleagues made a very interesting comment, said, see, we're all doing fine. And we were all having fun until the Muslim showed up and ruined the party. So that is the first element of what I'm going to be talking about. When Muslims show up, they ruin the party. So how can this madness be stopped and the parties can go on? The second uh, element is uh, from uh, maybe 14, 15 years ago when I was in Manitoba. And I was doing my PhD there. And I was stopped by uh, a professor at the time and later a colleague and a good friend. Uh, he just stopped me in the hallway and said, Abdi, what is wrong with you? And I said, you mean personally? Well, there are lots of things wrong with me personally. But he uh, said, no, I mean you guys. And he said, you mean who? The Iranians, you mean? He uh, said, no, you Muslims. And I uh, said, so what about us Muslims? And he said, well, why uh, don't you let this peace process go on? I said, which peace process are we talking about? Uh, when I left home, it was a perfect peace there. So I said, no, this, this peace process that's between Yasser Arafat and uh, Ehud Barak that is going on in Washington, and Bill Clinton is brokering. I said, oh, I just learned about that. So somehow I had to be able to justify why the peace process is not going on, I as one of the Muslims that were there. So, and uh, there was something wrong there, and this something wrong had to do with my Muslimness. So it seems that this is the second element of the question and the problem that I'm going to be talking about. There is some perception out there that there is something about Muslims that is different. And of course, what is common in, uh, among all Muslims is their Muslimness, is their religion, their faith. So there is something about their faith that um, is a problem, there is something wrong with it. And of course, going back to that first element, wherever they show up, they ruin the party. So we want to see what is uh, the extent of, what is the, the level of validity of an argument uh, like this, and really how much of it is a product of media, how much of it is uh, because of inadequacies in the way that we have approached these issues, and then eventually, uh, whether or not there are any solutions for this. So what I just mentioned is a part of what I have called the Muslim question. And I will explain later on why I came up with this, this title for this problem and also for my book. The Muslim question, basically the way that uh, it is presented in the media, refers to some sort of perceived problem in the relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims. Sometimes people talk about Muslim nations and non-Muslim uh, countries. Sometimes they talk about Muslim, Muslim minorities uh, and other non-Muslim groups within the same country. So the perception is that there is something wrong there. And this something has to do with 
uh, Muslims being unable or unwilling to live peacefully uh, with, with others. So there is something that has to be done about that part and has to, uh, the solution has to be found there. Now, if we, uh, this is not really a new problem. It is something that has been around for quite some time, but it has got more visibility just recently, and especially after the September 11. But as you'll see, some of the people that have talked about this issue, they have talked about this long before the September 11, 20, 2001. Uh, there are people from the Muslim side of the equation who have talked about this issue, and there are people that have claimed to be representing the sort of the native-born uh, populations. Uh, some of the early responses that came from the Muslim side of the equation uh, are the ones that were uh, heavily influenced by the kind of discourses that were happening in India, Indian subcontinent. For the reason, for the obvious reason that uh, India has a very large Muslim minority group and the issue of the relationship between that minority and the Hindu population and the non-Muslim population, Sikhs and others, uh, has always been an issue. And it has been because of the size of that minority, uh, Muslim minority population, the issue has been a very big sort of issue on the national agenda always. Uh, the Muslim thinkers and scholars and leaders who have responded to this issue and have tried to sort of suggest something could be categorized in sort of four, uh, under four different headings. One being those, uh, and these are all the ones that have eventually sort of uh, exported their perceptions and their conceptualization of the problem to immigrant receiving countries in North America and Western Europe. There have been uh, people at the time of the uh, Indian uh, independence movement who thought that uh, the main problem that we have to face and deal with is the uh, British imperialism, colonialism. And once that problem is out of the way, everything else will be taken care of, including the issue of Muslim-non-Muslim relationship. Therefore, for this group, and these are the Muslim uh, folks who were supporting the independence movem movement and were a part of the uh, Congress party, uh, and they, they thought that it is not really a big issue. We don't have to really spend any, any time on that or any thinking on that. There were those who thought, no, there is something there. Muslims want to have their own distinct identity and lifestyle, and they want to uh, live uh, a life that is uh, sort of loyal to their uh, faith. But they don't really have to be in any sort of antagonistic relationship with other, other groups. So folks like Ali Nadvi, for example, that has written one of these books, uh, suggest that, that, well, Muslims can stick to their own you know, religious ideas and principles and beliefs, uh, but live peacefully, distinctly, but peacefully with other groups as well. So here we had some sort of harmonious relationship between two very distinct groups. They didn't have to really try to influence each other's lives. There were those who said that, well, this is not possible. We have to opt for out of India and, and create our own nation, our own country, a sovereign state, a separate state for, for Muslims. And Muhammad Ali Jannah, the leader, the first leader of Pakistan, and Iqbal, uh, Muhammad Iqbal, and the Muslim League Party, these were the guys who eventually pushed for uh, an independent state, Pakistan, and, and eventually it happened. But Within that group, there was a sort of a second branch who were thinking that not only we need to have a separate state, this separate state has to function on the basis of Islamic principles. So we need an Islamic state, a separate Islamic state, not just a, a separate state for, uh, for Muslims. Now, all of these folks or, or people who uh, were promoting these different ideas, at one point, they had traveled to other countries in Western Europe, wherever there was a sort of Muslim, uh, a sizable Muslim population, and they had sort of promoted the same ideas. For example, Abul Allah Maududi, the uh, guy whose picture is there, was, for example, in uh, United States in the late 1970s, and 
uh, he was basically trying to sort of create some sort of uh, North American version of the idea that he had promoted in India. But as you can see in all of these different, except for the, for the first one, in all of these, the emphasis is that Muslims are a distinct group. They have a dif distinct uh, lifestyle, and then we have to find a way uh, that this group can, can live with other ones, either separately and, uh, or, or in some sort of cooperation with them. Now, the uh, non-Muslim or the native-born side of the equation, there were, there were of course, uh, different types of voices coming from that circle. But the ones that were very sort of extremist, and you can hear uh, them quite often these days as well, and these are the examples that I have taken from just some recent uh, discussions. Uh, for example, some of these folks in the beloved Fox News channel uh, have argued that, well, this problem is not uh, solvable. It doesn't have an easy solution. We have to just stop all immigration, uh, all, all Muslim immigration to the United States, in this case, uh, to solve the problem. So basically, they want to erase the question by itself. And then, of course, after hearing uh, this suggestion, some have argued that, well, we have a whole bunch of Muslims here as well, even if you stop the uh, immigration, that doesn't completely uh, remove the problem. And they have been very quick to suggest something for that part of the problem as well. Or we can send them back. So this is an easy solution. But both of these two sets of responses, the ones coming from the Muslim circles and the ones coming from these folks, uh, seem to have shared one sort of assumption. And that is the fact that the Muslim presence in these immigrant receiving countries is a temporary an arbitrary um, phenomenon. And they can choose to go back to their home country. So there is always that option of going back. And therefore, for this temporary solution, we have the temp temporary problem, we have to find some temporary solutions. And after that, it will be, the problem will be, will be solved. More recently, however, there is more and more awareness of the fact that it is not a temporary problem. It is a much more permanent issue. And the Muslims who are living in these countries, a lot of cases, these are second generation Muslims, for example, they have been born here, there is no home countries for them, and therefore those responses and those kind of solutions would not work. Uh, and that has generated a new set of uh, studies and uh, new discourses about this issue, which are much more reasonable, much more balanced. And, and, and these balanced uh, uh, views and responses are coming from both Muslim and non-Muslim circles. For example, uh, here, these are just a sample of some of the recent studies done in uh, Canada or where Canadians who have approached this issue in a, in a more sophisticated way. They haven't operated under the assumption that this is a, a small problem, a temporary problem that has to be, uh, can be, can be removed very easily. So they have tried really to learn about what is happening in this situation and what are the kind of things that they are uh, sensitive to or what they want, what are the preferences, what are the challenges. But the more important development is what is happening on the Muslim side of the equation. And uh, there are more and more Muslim scholars who are coming to this understanding that uh, all the traditional and conventional solutions to Muslims for the, their daily problems are not useful and are not applicable to this particular group of Muslims. This is a different group of Muslims. When you are a Muslim living in Muslim majority country, your challenges and your resources and the possibilities are quite different from when you are a Muslim minority living in a non-Muslim majority country. So because of that understanding, now they are talking about this issue in a very different way. One thing that you would notice here, for example, is uh, this word, Western Muslims. This is a reflection of that new new approach. This is uh, written by Tarek Ramazan, I'm sure you know him. Uh, basically his argument is that we are not talking about Muslims living in West. We are talking about Western Muslims. This is a different, different group and therefore different type of thinking is required to deal with their problems. 
more interestingly, this is more sort of coming from more academic and more modern uh, circles uh, among Muslims. But this is more interesting. This is coming from a more traditional uh, corner of the Muslim world. This is a book written by uh, a very highly esteemed uh, scholar in the Middle East, Dr. Yusuf al qarazavi And the title of the book is Fi Fakhal Aliyat al Muslima. Basically, it means on the jurisprudence of Muslim minorities. So, basically, what he is suggesting is that a different type of jurisprudence or fiqh is needed that is distinct from uh, the uh, type of things that we have always been used to and we knew about uh, fiqh and, and the kind of solutions that they would give for uh, the daily problems that Muslims have. And the subtitle is also interesting. Hayat al-Muslimin Vasat al-Mushtamaat al-Ukhra that basically means the lives of Muslims in other countries, not in their own homelands. And as a result of these two developments, one coming from the uh, native-born side, the other from the Muslim side, now it seems that we are positioned in a much better place to, to think about this issue and to talk about the sort of the real uh, problems that are there and uh, hopefully come up with some solutions for it. So it is against this sort of uh, broad backdrop that I have approached this issue. So assuming that we have that Muslim question, which is the uneasy relationship between Muslims and non-Muslims, the question is that does that have a solution? And, uh, what, and what are, first of all, what are the sources of the problem? And then what are the solutions? Uh, what does history tell us about similar cases in the past? Uh, are there any similar cases? And what does, and, or what do the data, the empirical data, tell us about this? In terms of the uh, lessons from history, especially for those of you who are coming from uh, sociology, you have probably seen this book by uh, or a book with this title from Karl Marx, The Jewish Question. And that was not just a book uh, by Marx. There were all sorts of people that at that time, and I'm talking about late 19th century and early 20th century, they were talking about this Jewish question. And it is interesting to uh, consult with that literature because a lot of things that they say about the Jewish question is exactly the kind of things that are being said about the Muslim question. Uh, the, the, one of the sort of the big names who initiated this whole discussion was a German guy uh, who wrote, and this is basically on the uh, on the Jews. That, that's the title of his book, uh, Bruno Bauer. So he thought that well, yes, there is a problem there, and the reason for this problem is that there is something about Jews that is different in terms of their religious convictions, in terms of their racial origin that doesn't let a peaceful coexistence with non-Jews to happen. So uh, because the religion and the race is forcing them to live in perpetual separation from the rest of the mankind, not even uh, the other parts of the population. So this was the understanding that was very dominant at the time. Marx and a couple of other folks like Leon Trotsky, for example, one of the leaders of the uh, communist revolution in Russia, uh, who, who wrote on this issue, they were trying to suggest that, well, it did not have, that this doesn't have anything to do with race, it doesn't have anything to do with religion. It is a pure social and economic issue, and if there is any solution, we have to find it there. They suggested capitalism, nature building processes as, as the root uh, causes and forces of the Jewish question. And what I think uh, sort of links this to the study that I have done is that I th it seems that the essence of the work that I have done is some sort of shift from the cultural explanation, racial explanation to socioeconomic experiences in terms of uh, what Muslims are experiencing. So this was the dominant understanding at that time, late 19th century, early 20th century. Now, fast forward to 100 years later, this is uh, a graph that I have pretty much stolen from uh, a book by Robert Putnam and 
Campbell at the American Grace, 2010. Uh, it has all sorts of very interesting things in, uh, in the book, but this is the part that is uh, rel related to what I'm talking about. It is, uh, they have developed this sort of uh, feeling thermometer, how people feel about different groups. And uh, they have asked this question from uh, the whole population, well, in, this, in the survey that they have done from their sample. And what is interesting is that the groups that are at the top are the groups that are liked by pretty much everyone. And the size of the uh, circles are sort of corresponding with the size of the population of those groups. What's interesting here, you see the Jewish group is at the top, liked pretty much by everyone, despite their small size. And also what's interesting here is that Muslims are at the bottom here, so quite the two sides of the scale. But what it tells us is that, if you remember all the discussions by, by Bauer and Marx and all those folks, basically that is where they started from in terms of where the Jewish group was. And somehow the Jews have managed to move from there to here, from the bottom of the scale to the top of the scale. So at least this tells us that, uh, based on this historical example, it is possible to have a situation in which one group is perceived uh, as having some sort of difficulty coexisting with others and also uh, be perceived as having some sort of racial and cultural features that do not let that peaceful coexistence to come about, but somehow, magically, they managed to uh, move from the least liked group to become the best liked or the, the highest one in terms of the feeling thermometer. So that historical evidence is telling me that there is hope that we can do something here. And because of that, I try to look at the sort of social and economic uh, information uh, with regard to Muslims and uh, see whether there is anything that we can learn about this situation and if there is anything that we can add to the, uh, to the picture. One thing that I have learned over so many years of presenting in different settings is to give my conclusions at the beginning so that I don't have to worry all the time about running out of time or something. So these are my conclusions. <laughs> and the, Basically, there are three parts to these conclusions. Uh, when we look at the data, and, and this is good to have this early in the game so that you can look at the data, see whether they really confirm or, or support these uh, conclusions. In terms of the relationship between Muslims and the Canadian society in general, things are good at the moment. There is no major problems. This is very different from what is happening in Europe, for example, in Germany, in France. There are, in the Netherlands, there are actual issues which are very uh, hot topics and uh, you cannot really make the same observation for, for them. So things are good here. When you compare Muslims with other uh, minority groups, religious minority groups, immigrant groups, things do not look as good. So in comparative terms, there is something to worry about a little bit. When you get to the indicators of what's going to happen in the future, things get a little worse. So there is really something to worry about here. Something uh, serious is happening there. So I want to look at these different uh, aspects and, and look at the data that speak to these different, different parts. The last part of my conclusions uh, is that these things seem to be happening not necessarily for cultural reasons, but for social and economic reasons. So in case I run out of time, this is uh, what I want you to walk away from with uh, from my presentation. So let's look at some of the data under these three uh, headings. Things are good at the moment. We know that by looking at some indicators of uh, satisfaction and the sort of the, the feelings that Muslims have toward the general population. Uh, this is based on a, a survey that was done by, by Environics in 2006. How satisfied or dissatisfied Muslims are? 80% are satisfied with their overall experience in Canada. 
whether they characterize their experiences as good or bad, or whether they have had any bad experiences as a result of their religious background or their ethnic background or, or skin color or anything. Uh, about 70% say they have had only good experiences, about 30% say bad experiences. Uh, whether they are willing and, and prepared to adopt the Canadian customs and Canadian culture or versus whether they want to remain distinct, about more than 50%, 55% say uh, that they want, that they are willing to adopt Canadian customs. About 20%, uh, 20 some percent say that they want to remain uh, distinct. And there is something about another 25% in between. And those in between, uh, the folks in that in between category, basically for my reading is that they are at least open to the idea of adopting the Canadian custom. So it seems that generally they are not opposed to getting the or, or, or adopting the Canadian customs. And that is a good sign in the sense of sort of indicating a healthy relationship between Muslims and uh, the general population. Another question was asked in this survey whether uh, uh, they think that most of Canadians or how many of Canadians they think are hostile to Muslims. Uh, very few, about 35 percent, another 40 percent, just some. And the Muslims who think that there are a lot of Canadians who are hostile to Muslims altogether are close to 15 percent. So about 85 percent at least are on the right side of the equation or the scale. When they were asked, what do you think about the Canadians, the native-born Canadians? Of course, there was no question on the native-born Canadians. It was asked, they were asked about the Christians, the Jews, the different uh, type of groups. But I, take, uh, I took the question on Christians as speaking to sort of the majority of native-born Canadians. What they think about uh, Canadians uh, or, or Christians, uh, again, somewhat favorable and very favorable. Together, something close to 80%. Again. So they think that uh, Canadians are not hostile towards them, and they th have a very positive view towards native-born Canadians. So that is, again, another good sign, another uh, indicator of a healthy state of relationship. Now. You notice that the background of the slide changed from green to yellow. So not, things are not as good compared to the other groups. Again, that's when you uh, compare Muslims with other or people of other religious backgrounds. And I have uh, included just a couple of slides here, but there are there's much more than that. There are so many different indicators. I didn't want to just repeat them one after another. In almost all of them, consistently, you will see that Muslims are scoring either at the bottom of the uh, scale or, when, or, or they're second. And that is when they are lucky enough to have Jehovah's Witnesses in the equation as well. They become the last one. The Muslims become the second one. So they have something to be grateful for, for the presence of Jehovah's Witnesses, I guess. Uh, proportion of population who think most people can be trusted. Trust towards the general population. Again, for Muslims, it is the second. Here is where the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses come to the rescue. So they become second last group. And the differences are quite noticeable here, from 45% to about 70% for the, for the highest group. The proportion of uh, uh, members of the different groups who have voted in the uh, federal election, and this is out of all those who are eligible to vote in the federal election, the lowest is uh, for Muslims, of course, after Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, the background changed to red. So we're getting into the red zone. Not likely to remain as good in the future. This relatively healthy state of relationship when Muslims are asked uh, how concerned they are about the, the future of Muslims in Canada, 35%, uh, another 25%, but 60% say that they are either somewhat concerned or very concerned. And that is something to think about. So even 
noticed it in previous slides that there was a large proportion of Muslims who were happy about their situation here and, and happy about, satisfied about their uh, experiences. But it seems that a portion of those folks are not very optimistic about the future, at least. <clears throat> How concerned are you about some of these things happening uh, against Muslims or among Muslims? The three ones for those of you who cannot see the bottom of the page. This is discrimination, this is unemployment, and that is the extremism. And again, you see the percentages vary from 65 to about 55%. Again, a large proportion of the Muslim population think that they are really, really worried about discrimination. They are worried about uh, unemployment and uh, sort of the economic problems. And some of them think that uh, not necessarily they don't say that as a result of these things, but they are at least worried about the occurrence of extremism among Muslims. Still in the red zone, <coughs> uh, this is from a longitudinal survey of immigrants to Canada called LSEC, and this is a very rich set of data uh, generated by the Statistics Canada that looks at immigrants who arrived in the early 2000s. And, uh, surveys them six months after their arrival, surveys them again two years after arrival, surveys them uh, four years after arrival. So it captures that initial period of settlement in Canadian society and their sort of the changes that happen in those, in those initial years. So a question is asked uh, whether you think your Canadian experience has been better, worse, or the same as what you uh, expected it to be. And these are the answers for those who have said it has been better than expected. As you notice that the, the line, the trend lines are generally upward. So that means even if they are uh, having some difficulties in way one after six months, after two years they feel better, after four years they feel even stronger that uh, things are going well or better than expected. The only exception to this trend is the Muslim group. That they follow the trend between the first and the second wave, but somehow after the second year, uh, they develop a different type of feeling. So they think that this uh, experience has not been better than what they had expected. The outcome, and again, as I said, there are a whole bunch of other indicators that I didn't uh, want to include and spend too much time on those, but they're basically speaking to the same uh, effect. The outcome in the same survey, people have been asked whether, if you had to start all over again, whether you would come to Canada. The group, uh, again, the, the percentages are quite high, so a lot of them still would have done it if they uh, had, had to do it again. But you see that the second lowest is reported by, by Muslims. So there seems to be something there that doesn't quite work and it is creating all sorts of uh, reservations. Possible reasons, as I mentioned, I uh, looked into the sort of their experiences in different areas, economic, social, institutional areas. I'm just talking about the, the economic and some of the social areas here. Uh, in terms of Economic. Let's see if there is anything in, in those areas that sort of corresponds with this situation or can act or serve as the, the reason or the basis for the kind of patterns that we just uh, saw. Canadian Census 2001. And remember that this data is looking mostly at the things that have happened in 2000, the year before the income they, they had, the employment, all these things. So this is before September the 11th. Doesn't have any sort of connection to what happened after that. There are two things that are shown here. One is the average income of different groups. And you see that for Muslims, the, the bars are showing that is the lowest. And the triangles here are showing the number of weeks, the average number of weeks that they have worked in the previous year. Again the lowest one on this scale is for, for Muslims. As you can see, it is much higher for the other groups. So there is something in the economic uh, arena that 
does not uh, work to uh, in, in Muslims' favor, and that might explain some of the misgivings and some of the reservations that they have expressed in the previous ones. Power rate, another economic indicator. Based on 2001 census, the highest poverty rate, close to 45 percent for Muslims. And you can see the difference is quite significant between the second uh, highest group is those of Eastern religion, and for them it is 22, 3 percent, so almost twice, twice as big as the next highest group. Okay, you can sort of uh, do the same thing with all sorts of other economic indicators with the same kind of results. So if that is uh, consistent and if that shows that Muslims are economically disadvantaged in terms of uh, uh, income, in terms of employment, in terms of poverty rate, uh, what are some of the reasons behind them? Could it be there are a whole bunch of reasons that can generate uh, those, those patterns? It could be because of their lower level of education. Could be the case that Muslims are coming with less education than others, and therefore they are suffering not because of their Muslimness, but because of their lower uh, education. It could be because of their immigrant status. The fact that they are immigrants, immigrants have to, of course, reset their lives after arrival. They have to go through so many challenges. And uh, so life is difficult, especially in the first few years. And the disadvantages that you see might be because Muslims are predominantly immigrants, and it is because of their immigrant status, not, again, their Muslimness. The recency or recentness of uh, immigration, again, among immigrants, those who have come more recently, of course, they are more likely to suffer from these sort of economic disadvantages compared to the more established ones. It could be because of the uh, language problems that they face. Some immigrant groups seem to have uh, a, a more difficult time learning a new language or developing their sort of the accents and everything. So it could be, for example, for them could be things might happen more slowly or, or more poorly as a result of the language problems. Or it could be because a lot of them haven't had any sort of work experiences before. and. Therefore, what we see here is the reflection of that rather than anything else. So these are some likely factors behind those observed uh, trends. We'll look at them very quickly, starting with the lower level of education. This is distribution from the same data, distribution of different religious groups in terms of the level of education or, or the percentage of population that are in these different uh, educational categories. The dark line here is representing Muslims. What you see here is starts from the lowest level of education to the, to the highest, which is uh, doctorate. And if you see, if you follow the, the black line here, you will see that it's the second lowest after Jewish in all of these categories until we had the university education. And from there, they become the second highest. So this black line basically is showing that after the Jewish uh, group, Muslims are uh, the group that has the highest level of education. So it doesn't quite match with uh, the economic performance that, that we saw, a higher proportion of uh, people with higher education. Could be because they are immigrants. Just distinguish any of those in the economic indicators by immigrant status, and you will see whether there are any differences between immigrants and non-immigrants, and whether that can explain that. Uh, I did that for the poverty rate, and what you see here is that, uh, first of all, you will see that the poverty rate is higher for Muslims compared to all other groups. But when you distinguish between immigrants and non-immigrants, you see that there's not much difference there. So immigration status or being an immigrant doesn't seem to be explaining what we noticed before. Being recent immigrants, like among immigrants, being recent immigrants, whether that has anything to do with what we notice. And we know that by looking at the distribution of 
uh, these different groups on the basis of the time of arrival. We know that Muslims, for example, have started arriving in Canada in large numbers after uh, reform, reforms in the immigration law in the 1960s. And you'll see that this sort of black area is growing quite, quite fast. So there are lots of uh, Muslims who are recent immigrants, and that could be the reason for what we have, we have seen. Now, looking at the data from ELSIC, uh, look at the income reported by all these recent immigrants. So these are all recent immigrants who have arrived at the same time and have been interviewed in two, three points. Uh, all of them have been interviewed. They have reported what has happened to them. So this is their average income since they have arrived. And you'll see the good news is that it is sort of an upward trend for all of them. It means that their average income has been improving, including for Muslims. But you'll see that Muslims remain the lowest in all these three waves. So their income has increased alongside all those other groups. But they remain the lowest uh, group in terms of how much they make. And this doesn't have anything to do with the recency of their immigration, because all of them are recent. So basically, we turn the recency of immigration into a constant rather than a variable. And we'll see that there is not much. Uh, uh, we see that even with that, among the recent immigrants, Muslims are still uh, disadvantaged. The same concept is still being recent immigrants. Another sort of uh, the flip side of the coin, that was for income. This is for the amount of time that it takes for Muslims or for these different groups to arrive at or to land on their first job. For Muslims, it is the highest with nine, nine months. So basically, it takes them much longer than all other immigrant groups to find that first employment. And of course, that would impact the type of income that they will have and the average income for the whole group. So could it be because of the immigrant category, refugees, family class, versus uh, skilled worker and business class? I've just broken that initial graph down by different categories. For skilled worker immigrants, you see that, again, Muslims are the ones who are disadvantaged. For family class immigrants, the same story. For refugee class immigrants, they are in the middle. For business class immigrants, they are at the top. But the business class immigrants are very, very small. And uh, the fact that they actually have a higher income might have influenced the overall average for the, for the Muslims, or all, all immigrants. So if you look at the most important, most important from the policymaking uh, perspective, most impor important category of uh, immigrants, which is the skilled worker, we'll see that the same story is still there for, for Muslims. The lowest income is reported for now. Could it be because of uh, language barriers? In the same data set, I'll say, there is a question uh, about uh, what was the most uh, important difficulty that you experienced since arrival. And there is a long range of answers that uh, these people have provided. Of course, the most frequently uh, noted category is finding an adequate job. The second one is uh, learning the language, the language barriers. That is for all immigrants. Now, if language was responsible for the trends that we had seen, when we compare Muslims with other groups, we should see a higher proportion of Muslims reporting difficulties with language. This is what they have reported for finding the job, which is, as expected, is the highest one. This is what they have reported for the language difficulty. They're the lowest, actually. So it seems that the, lang the difficulty or struggling with language doesn't match with the kind of uh, difficulties that they are struggling with in terms of the uh, employment or uh, income or all those economic indicators. Can it be that their 
that haven't had any sort of prior work experience, or a large portion of them haven't had prior work experience, and therefore, therefore that is translating itself into lower economic performance in Canada. This is uh, the percentage of uh, the members of these groups that have reported that they have worked before coming to Canada, separated by gender. And again, you'll see that the high proportion of uh, male immigrants have reported that they have worked, and that is what we expect, because those are mostly the principal uh, applicants, and if they haven't had any sort of job experience, they wouldn't get the uh, marks for that, and that vetoes their whole application. But what you will see here, which is interesting, is that uh, for the two groups of Muslims and Eastern religion, women have reported much lower percentage of having worked before coming to Canada. So it is possible that when they come to Canada, these two groups, because of the lack of work experience, they are not able to find a job, they are not able to uh, do very well economically, and that affects the overall average and brings down the whole average for, the whole, for these two groups. So if that is the reason, we should expect to see a lower uh, economic performance for the members of these two groups, the women that have come from Eastern religion background or from Muslim background. What you see here is that that is true only for Muslims, not for the other group. So even if the uh, prior work experience is an, or lack of prior work experience is, a, is an issue for after migration experiences, that is only valid for Muslims. The other group, the Eastern religion background, is there with the rest of the immigrants. So somehow they are able to overcome that difficulty, but Muslim women are not. So if that is, that was a sort of a universal uh, phenomenon, we should have, uh, we would have expected to see the same thing happening for both groups, but no, it's happening only for Muslim women. So if it is not education, if it is not uh, prior work experience, if it is not uh, immigrant category, immigrant status, all those things, what else can we think of? Try to sort of imagine any other possible factor. These are the ones that I could think of. Uh, it is possible that the rate of recognition to prior work experience is not the same. Not that they, you haven't had work experience, but somehow in the, in the Canadian market that's not rewarded. It is possible that uh, education, you don't have less education, but your education is not rewarded to the same extent that it is rewarded for uh, other groups. And of course it is possible that there is some kind of discrimination at work as well, and that might have uh, something to do with the economic performances that we just saw. Okay, so very quickly going over this. Lower rate of recognition of non-Canadian work experience, that means the uh, work experience prior to coming to Canada. A lot of these immigrants report, well, about 30, 40 percent to 50 percent, they report that their uh, prior work experience has not been accepted in Canada. So these are the percentage for those who, whose work experience has not been uh, recognized. What you see that uh, the groups that are low remain low. The groups that are high, they start declining after the wave two and the wave three. The only group that remains high, and actually it increases, is for Muslims. So it seems that after the second year, after the fourth year of being in Canada, the problem, the severity of this problem subsides for all immigrant groups except for Muslims. So that probably is a factor that is generating all the, the sort of performance indicators that we looked at. Lower, a possible lower return to education. Uh, we had the different uh, degrees and different levels of education that people had, and then their average income reported for all three waves of this uh, ELSEC data. What we see here is that, of course, a lot of immigrants start at a very uh, low end of the scale. And then over time, uh, and then uh, depending on what your degree is, 
you get a better reward. And obviously and uh, expectedly, there is a higher return to those who have higher education, have university education, and which is, I guess, a good news for all of us in this room. So there is hope. Mm -hmm. uh, looking at the same thing in the uh, second wave, that is two years after they are here. What you notice is that for all of them, the sort of the starting point has jumped up, which is again another piece of good news. And for all of them, this sort of positive uh, and increasing trend lines are, are there. For Muslims, something has changed. Notice that this line is, is a straight line. Now. Before, it was a sort of an exponential rate. So there was an increasing rate of return for having a higher degree. Having a higher degree is still a good thing now, but not to the extent that it was before. So adding one year of education to your high school education is going to reward you the same as having one year of education to your doctoral studies, which is different from what we saw before. Now, moving on to the third wave, the line starts plateauing. And actually, if there were more waves of this study, it might show some sort of decline after that. So it seems that there is a declining rate of return happening, return to education, that is happening for Muslims. It started with pretty much the same for all immigrants. There are other groups that are experiencing it, but it's not as consistent as it is for Muslims. But over time, it seems that they are not getting the kind of rewards that other groups are getting for the same type of education. To what extent discrimination is a part of this uh, picture? And as you would appreciate, discrimination is one of the most complicated and difficult things to, to measure. Uh, we don't have enough courageous people who can step forward and say that I have discriminated against this or that. So we have to approach them in all sorts of uh, secret ways and tricky approaches to find out what's happening. So uh, the, first of the, first, the, the least sophisticated way of doing that is to ask people who are the likely victims of discrimination, whether you feel that you have been discriminated against. Uh, what the answers are, that there are uh, a couple of different questions in the, in the survey that is asking whether you have ever felt that you have been discriminated against based on your religious background, based on your ethnic background, based on your racial uh, origin. So uh, this is the question based on religious discrimination. Uh, here, Muslims are with a very sort of wide margin the highest group that have reported anything, uh, sort of any discriminatory act against them because of their religious background. Focus, this is for the overall uh, population of these groups. This is focusing only on the skilled workers. These are the ones that are doing better economically, and these are the ones that can uh, integrate into the Canadian job market much more easily than the other groups. They are the ones in the job market, basically, that are feeling that even much more than the the overall population. So the more they are engaged in the Canadian economy and are working and in the Canadian life, the stronger this feeling is that they are being discriminated against on the basis of their religion. The question has been asked from them whether they have felt any discrimination based on their ethnic cultural background. And again, what you see here is that uh, for all of these groups, it either remains uh, the same or declines or it remains relatively low. For Muslims, it uh, remains stable at the, at the top, pretty much. So after, this, after the third wave, after four years of being in Canada, the Muslim moved from the, being the second highest group to the topmost group. It seems that, again, something might be there that is happening uh, with regard to discrimination. Uh, now, this is another interesting thing. Those questions were asking people about discrimination based on their religious background, based on ethno-cultural uh, 
background. This is asking them based on racial uh, origin. And Muslims have been fair enough to say that, well, they haven't faced any or, or, or a high degree of racial discrimination. But the interesting thing is that for all these groups, it is declining. For Muslims, it's the only one that is increased. So it seems that even the things that are not a big part of being a Muslim, which is the racial feature, is also becoming a subject uh, or, or, or reason for uh, them feeling uh, discriminations. But these were from the immigrants who were included in that survey on, uh, from ELSEC. I asked, oh, well, I uh, used a, a different data set as well, the environics data. Who asked, the, in which the question was asked from all Muslims, regardless of whether they were immigrants or not, uh, how worried you are about uh, the occurrence of a dis discrimination against Muslims in Canada. And you'll see that the numbers are quite high here. 35% here, another 30%, almost 65% are quite worried that discrimination is happening against them. But uh, as we know, these uh, like I said, this is not really a very sophisticated way of measuring discrimination because these are the people that would benefit from saying that we have been discriminated against. These are the people that would say, well, if I'm not having a decent job, it's because people are discriminating against me. So it is a justification for perhaps their poor performance in other, or lack of hard working, or whatever other reasons are at work. A better measure of this, more reliable, is to ask the other group which is the native-born population, whether you think this is happening against Muslims. Because if they say, uh, because they are the ones that have uh, a benefit in saying that, no, it's not happening. Because if it is happening, then they are the ones who are doing it, basically. Uh, when this question is asked from them, from Canadians, you'll see the pattern is exactly the same. So uh, there is, actually, it is higher than what Muslims have reported. It is closer to. 75% rather than 65% that they think that Muslims are subject to discrimination occasionally or often. And that's not talking about the future, it's talking about today, today's uh, Canada. Then I felt that even this might be a little problematic. We might not really be looking at a very objective assessment by these folks. Some of these might have uh, sort of a light for Muslims or Islam, whatever reason, it might be more sort of uh, enlightened people, more intellectually oriented, and they say good things about uh, what is happening or not happening there. The true measure of this is to separate these answers by those who like Muslims and those who don't. See what difference is there. And again, the expectation is that if this was a function and product of their likes or dislikes for Islam and Muslims, then those who like Muslims should say that, yes, discrimination is happening against them. Those who are not should say that, uh, no, nothing big is happening there. One part of that assumption was true. When I looked at the positive, those who have a positive view of Islam, um, a negative impression, and neither positive negative. The, the distribution of answers is telling me that Yes, those who have a positive view are more likely to admit that discrimination is happening against Muslims in uh, sort of large numbers of them, often and occasionally. Now, what we should expect to see, if my assumption was true that it is a function of their likes or dislikes for Islam, we should see the exact opposite of this for those for with sort of negative impression of Islam. And that is exactly the same. So even those with a negative view of Islam, those who don't care much about Muslims and Islam, they are ready to admit that there is a high level of discrimination happening against them. And interestingly, even the third category is the same. So it is not a function of, for those of you who are more statistically oriented, that indicates that there is no correlation between these two, basically, because the pattern is repeating itself through all the different categories of this other variable. So basically, when I put all those together, that gives me the kind of inclusion, the conclusions that I gave you at the beginning, that uh, things, things seem to be OK with regard to Muslim. Not, not OK, actually, they're good. 
uh, when we compare different groups, then there is a reason to pause and think a little more. And when we are thinking about the things that might be happening in the future, there's even more reasons to pause and think seriously. Uh, in terms of the factors that were at work with regard to those economic trends, it seems that the, the first group of, uh, I call them the innocent uh, group of variables, they do not seem to be uh, at work. They do not seem to be explaining what is happening. And this uh, bottom set of uh, variables are much more visible and present in those economic experiences. So the last slide, uh, what those information are telling us. It seems to me that Muslims are having economic uh, difficulties in the economic uh, domain, in the economic experiences arena. But these economic experiences are not caused by the sort of technical issues that we would expect to happen, for example, if your credentials are not recognized. This is a technical issue. If your work experience cannot be transferred for whatever reason, that is a technical issue. But the economy does not operate only on the basis of these technical uh, elements. There is a strong social element present in the, in the economic domain as well. If, for example, your employer, potential employer doesn't like you, he wouldn't hire you. And this like and dislike play a, a crucial role in the, in the economic domain, regardless of what kind of uh, credentials you might have. Think about another. Uh, Example, you know that we have the employment equity legislation here in Canada, and that says that uh, in sort of in, uh, when everything is equal, uh, the priority in hiring should go to visible minorities, women, those with disabilities, and is the last one Aboriginals. But someone has to make that decision to decide whether things are equal or not. And normally, at that point, these likes and dislikes will kick in. And they can very easily generate the kind of outcome that they like to happen at the beginning, regardless of whether this legislation is there or not. So there is a lot of room for these social uh, and uh, personal preferences to become a part of the picture when it comes to economic performance. And uh, therefore, what I have suggested is that there is some sort of mutual re, uh, relationship between these two domains. And uh, some of the things that are happening in the economic domain, of course, have to be fixed there, those technical issues. But the rest of them that are more social in nature have to be fixed in the, in the social uh, domain. How can those be fixed? And what are those social elements that are at work? I will not talk about them so that I can get invited again and talk about this. <laughs> All right. Thank you.